Okay, I think I'm going to get started. It's about that time. Um, hello, I'm Ken. I am a software engineer at Google, working on Apache Beam. I'm also on the Apache Beam Project Management Committee. I'm here to introduce you to stateful processing in Apache Beam. This is a major new addition to the Beam programming model. It unlocks new use cases and new efficiencies for some old new use cases. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about massive out-of-order streams, which you've probably heard a lot about so far in this conference, but I want to sort of set the tone for the level of abstraction of this talk. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how Apache Beam generally helps you address your data processing needs in that area uh, before I go on to really digging into the new feature of stateful processing. So if you're in this room, you probably have a stream of data you're interested in or would like to start producing such a thing. And here is how I'm going to draw streams. Uh, you've got little squares of inputs coming down from above and we're turning them into triangles. I'm going to use colors for keys because there's going to be a lot of grouping things by keys. So we've got red, green, and yellow here. And your streams are presumably going to be massive. You're going to get a lot of data. Um, and what I mean by that is that you need more than one computer to process these, right? You need a distributed system of computers cooperating. Um, and you need to, a way to program these computers. Um, and because it's distributed, you, know, you need to embrace all the programming paradigms that have come along, like MapReduce and Spark and whatnot. And lately, Beam. So where does all of this data come from? Uh, there are lots of possibilities. I'm just going to generalize. They're coming from devices that are out there across a network from you. Could be people using uh, some mobile app of yours. It could be like your juicer is radioing for more supplies. Um, the important thing is that connectivity uh, and transmission delays, and for lots of totally simple and pervasive reasons, the events that are being described in this data stream uh, are going to take place at a time different from when you process them. This is the event time, processing time difference. And the other thing that's important is that they're going to come out of order, because some of these devices are going to have wonky connectivity at different times. And you just need to still get the right answer, despite the fact that out of order delayed data is just, that's the facts. That's facts of life. So uh, some examples of applications out there that produce data like this. Uh, mobile gaming, as I mentioned, web analytics, wearables. I won't read the whole list. Basically anything that's processing events that happen. Right? If every piece of data has a timestamp that's when it happened, um, you can bet that Beam is going to help you. And you can process things that aren't events. You're just going to use fewer features of the programming model. So let's, let's talk about how Apache Beam fits into uh, your data processing needs. Um, if you, on a daily basis, think about what you're building kind of like this, like you've got a couple streams coming in, uh, maybe you do some transformations on them, and here I'm also archiving my outputs directly to some database, um, but then perhaps I'm doing a stream join and outputting a new stream that's going to be consumed a lot down the line. That's sort of the ballpark of where we're at. Um, the way you can think about it when you're programming it is as sort of boxes and arrows filters, joins, some of these boxes are going to contain whole topologies of other boxes. Um, and this is the DAG-based or graph-based computational model that's really popular. Um, I'll call these pipelines unless I slip up. So you're defining these pipelines. And you have a lot of choices of how you might do that. This is not an authoritative history. I am not qualified to do any such thing. I'm just putting out a rough timeline to show that you have so many choices, and they're exploding recently. Um, and the Beam is a newcomer on the scene that, for some reason, is just bigger and brighter. Um, so let's talk about how Beam fits into all of this. Here, I'm going to zoom in on this is one of the boxes uh, in your pipeline, one transformation. Um, summation per key. I'm taking all the red squares, I'm getting them in one place, and I'm adding them together. Uh, and likewise for the green squares and the yellow squares. And so I'm just showing them stacked on top of each other to indicate that they've sort of been gathered up and co-located somehow. This uh, boxes and arrows diagram 
is language independent and backend independent. So that's a theme of Beam. So you can take this description of the processing you want to do on your data and execute it on any of Beam's backends, any of these distributed data processing engines. So right now, Beam supports Google Cloud Dataflow, Apache Flink, Apache Spark, Apache Apex. These allow you a lot of operational scenarios depending on your needs. Um, Apache Gear Pump is on a feature branch. Uh, JSTORM has a feature branch started. There's lots of runners coming along. Um, and so to define the pipeline that you're gonna execute on one of these runners, uh, you write this kind of code in the language of your choice. That's the other half of Beam's portability vision. Um, so in Java, it looks like input.apply, some integers per key, and that's real Beam Python code uh, using the pipe operator there to sort of chain together your operations. So each of these takes place in a, the context of a Beam SDK, which produces a pipeline which then runs on any runner. That's sort of the portability story in terms of you can program in your favorite language and execute on your favorite runner. There's more to it, though. So I want to consider this scenario. I'm in Python, and I want to read my data out of Kafka. So I say, OK, Kafka.io.read. I've got some sort of syntax like this. Um, and that's constructing this sort of representation of my pipeline. But in fact, I'm referring to a Kafka.io connector that is already quite mature and written in Beam Java. And then my pipeline description is uh, provided to the data processing engine. And when it encounters this Kafka.io read, it's going to spin up a container with a harness that knows how to execute this Java uh, read operation. So this story also might generalize if you're, you're building a UI and you want your users to be able to script, for example, in any of Beam's languages, things like that. So this is another aspect of sort of the benefits of this sort of this nexus of all these things, this runner sort of engine agnostic, language agnostic representation of your computation. How does Beam do it? Um, the way that Beam achieves its portability is by trying to be, well, there's two ways. Um, sort of intellectually, it's trying to be canonical. We're taking things that are essential about what you want to do, what you want to get done, um, and we're breaking it down in these four categories. Um, I'm not going to talk about the, there's lots of great interplay where Beam adopts features of other systems and other systems adopt features from Beam. This is, this talk is more just sort of focused on the model and the pieces um, and how they're put together. So these four questions are how you write a pipeline in Beam. The first thing is you ask, what are you computing? And this means, like, where are you reading your data from? Are you going to join it, sum it? Are you computing, uh, like, a model of fraudulent users? Um, or are you just sort of doing basic aggregations or ETLs or filters? And then, because we're operating on streams, our data never actually ends, so we can't like process all of it, and that's where event time comes in, and this question of where in event time is your data distributed it would be the full question, and we want to ask, like, what slices of my data can I reasonably give an answer for that I'm interested in? So, for example, you might want to perform your computation over windows of an hour or a sort of sessions of user activity. Then you need to choose when in processing time you want results, and that is a um, Beam feature called triggers, which, where you can say, oh, I actually want to get, just wait until you think you've got all the data for an event time window and give me the output. Um, or possibly you just want repeated output constantly as new inputs coming in, right, because you want super low latency response. And if you're going to do that sort of repeated output, which are each sort of corrections to the prior, sort of converging on your final answer, then you need to decide how are you going to transmit that? Are you going to uh, just output like a full replacement value every time, or are you going to output a whole bunch of little incremental sums, for example, that need to get added up again later downstream? So these are the four questions that you need to ask, um, and a little whirlwind tour of them. Uh, I'm really here to talk about the what question. That is the area of the model that is being expanded right now. So this is reading, mapping, reducing. I'm not going to talk about Beam's parallel connectors. I'm going to talk about how you process your data once you've got it in. So starting from the beginning of parallel processing, you've got per-element computation. This is the most obvious 
embarrassingly parallel, incredibly scalable way of computing over your data. It's the map in MapReduce. It's like a super-powered flat map. But what's important about this is every item is processed independently, and it has a really easy stateless implementation, and streaming systems have done basically this uh, with different levels of sophistication for a long time. The next fundamental primitive of Veeam is per key operation. I'm gonna call it combine here because the important thing is you're getting all these elements into one place, all the red squares are getting gathered up and they're being combined in some way. So um, the difference here is that this has sort of a natural stateful implementation in stream processing, right? Your red elements are coming in and you're combining them in some way and you're just hanging on to that output um, in some sort of durable state until it's time to emit an output according to the trigger. So, um, so this will have like a stateful implementation, but what you do here is you write associative commutative operators uh, like you've been doing since whenever you were first introduced to MapReduce. So your code's not stateful, um, and I want to differentiate that from what we're talking about today. These two primitives are actually combined with reading in your data are the entirety of the what question for Beam. Um, you can do element-wise computation, and you can gather elements up by key um, and do aggregations on those. And they're great because they just work with all, in all kinds of scenarios. They scale out, so in that sense, they just work. You can parse, like if you just say, I wanna parse incoming events and filter out the bad data, there's no real limit on how many events you can uh, process, you know, depending on how many computers you can deploy. Or if you want to do, say, like a summation per hour, and you just wanna wait until you have all the data for the hour and output that, you're not gonna have to change your summation in order to do that. Um, if you wanna group into user sessions and just output as fast as possible, um, that's gonna work with any sort of ETL and aggregation you express with these. So that's why these are the primitives of Beam. But what if you need more control? This is something that comes up really all the time. Um, there's a lot of scenarios that don't quite fit into this like super pure functional programming model. So. Like, I need a little bit of state because I'm basically doing per element computation, but I tweak it now and again. Or you've got an aggregation that's not an associative commutative operator, or you don't really know how to naturally express it that way. Um, or Beam's triggers might not be specific enough for you. Maybe you need to do like really complex logic based on your domain. Like maybe it's when you see like four people with a green shirt on them that you wanna produce some output. Um, and another really interesting case is that you need to produce some output uh, when no data is coming in, for example, to indicate uh, that the user's uh, login has expired or something. All of those use cases are addressed by stateful processing. So this problem, knowing about it, trying to solve it, it's not new. Um, Beam didn't create the first solution to it. Uh, in Spark, you've got map with state. In Flink, you've got process function. It might be rich process function. In Apex, you can write a custom operator, and you've got things like this in pretty much every system. And I'll draw a picture of the mode of computation uh, that this sort of engenders. Um, it's sort of a hybrid. You take all the elements that have something in common, some key, all the red elements, you put them in one place, and then you process them one at a time. So it's sort of like per element computation, but you've got some slice of them. Um, and what you get from this group and then process per element is that you get the ability to sort of mutate some state on the side. I've got this little cylinder here uh, with a red, green, and yellow stripe indicating that there's a state for the, the red thread of processing, a piece of state for the green thread, and so on. Uh, and then you, maybe you can set timers so you can do things like notice that no data has come in for a while. Um, so, this form of processing, it exists in a number of systems um, in different guises, but you want this if you are an adherent to the Beam philosophy, you want it to just work when you've got out of order events. Right? You want it to work with event time windowing without having to change all, of, you know, change all your logic. And of course, you want it to be portable across these engines, you don't want to commit to any of them. So in Beam, uh, where we've added this is state and timers for Pardu. This is the subject of the talk. This is what we're here to talk about, is adding this mode of computation to Beam. And we'll talk about what you can do with it um, and a little bit of the details of sort of how it fits into the Beam model. So let's walk through an example just to see really what it looks like when you use this kind of processing. 
This blue box is uh, my transformation I'm going to write, and the cloud over there is some external service I got to communicate with. So let's say I'm reading all these red elements. They've already been grouped by key. Um, they're coming in one at a time. Um, and I need to enrich all of them. Every one of those them needs some kind of data that I'm going to have to make a round trip um, to get. Now, I can't just make a bunch of requests. For one, it would cost a whole bunch. It would be super slow. Um, but also, I'd probably overwhelm the service I'm talking to because I've got this massive distributed processing system just hammering someone's REST API. So maybe what I'm going to do is I will buffer up a bunch of elements, however many come in, and have a second. Um, and then I'll make one bulk request. So I set a timer, call me back in 500 millis, um, and I'll just buffer some data that describes what I want to uh, ask for from the external service. Timer goes off, and then I read from state, I pull out maybe four elements, make one round trip, and then output results based on what I got from the service. So this picture um, is a very different style of programming probably than you're used to if you've been working with uh, MapReduce-like frameworks. This is really sort of low-level, imperative, in the guts of the processor kind of programming. And this is the sort of thing you can do. Um, now, to your users, if you're building transforms for users um, or your fellow engineers or whatnot, um, they just, they're going to have events coming in. They're out of order, fundamentally. Um, and maybe they're going to specify some windowing to deal with that fact. And they're just expecting your black box or blue box sort of to just work. They, they don't care about the fact that you're batching requests, except that it costs less, and they want to get correct windowed output, right? So we need this to automatically work with windowing. Uh, whether or not your user says, I would like fixed windows of one hour, or I want 30-minute windows sliding by 10 minutes, we don't. In order to declare a success at having built this feature in Veeam, uh, this needs to work with just swapping out the top boxes. We can't have to change the second one. So how do we do it? It's actually not tremendously complicated. Uh, the first thing is that all of this state, it's all tracked per window, right? So here, the red slice of this cylinder is state that we're tracking while we process data about me. Um, and maybe every hour, we're looking at my activity on the B mailing list uh, in order to figure out what you think I'm doing. Um, and so from 9 to 10, it looks like I'm probably hacking because 10 minutes is low enough latency that I'm probably sitting at a computer. Um, and so uh, state is partitioned per window. And so that just works however you choose to organize your data into windows. And as a bonus, windows all end. So as uh, your system determines that it has all the data for a window and it's computed its final answer, uh, the state's automatically cleaned up for you. Anybody who's used this sort of stuff without that um, we'll probably think that's pretty convenient. Um, and another thing that needs to work just sort of automatically all the time as a fundamental tenet of processing is um, you need to unify your present and historical data. So Beam has this unified batch and streaming model. Um, and part of the pro point of that is that if you get the same input data coming in as a stream and you're processing it with this sort of low-level state machine you've created, um, but then you need to run an experiment on past data, you need to do a verification, or you find a bug and you need to reprocess old data. Uh, you need to be able to do that too. So then, then you're reading it from probably logs that whether or not they're in order, it, things become out of order when you merge them and whatnot. So given the same input data, you need to get sort of equivalent results. It doesn't have to be exactly the same. That's a, sort of up to you. But you do need to get uh, valid results, whether or not it's incoming as a stream or it's archived. And you do get this if you program uh, correctly within the model, uh, because you have to be robust to out-of-order data in your incoming stream anyhow, and then you get the out-of-order uh, robustness when you're dealing with the archive logs as well. So what else can you do with them? Lots of things. This is like the low-level tool that underlies all of the high-level um, processing. You can do domain-specific triggering, such as uh, I described one, but output when five people who live in Seattle have checked in. Um, I'd be really excited if there are five people from Seattle here. Um, and Or you can do slowly changing dimensions. You've got some enrichment data, like foreign exchange rates, that you need to just sort of keep up to date um, next to sort of deluge of transactions. You need state and timers to do proper stream joins. Um, you can do finer grained aggregations. So you can sort of, if you had a big aggregation with a huge accumulator, you can uh, gain new efficiencies. And 
sort of in the limit, you can really move away from the analytical mindset and you can start to do what we've come to term perky workflows. And that's like a user signs up and you move them through this funnel where you send them a reminder after some amount of time that they should go verify their account and if they don't, then you delete it or archive it. Um, and so this is interesting because it's really just a totally different way of using uh, Beam to do things that are transactional in a way. So, summary is stateful processing in Beam. It unlocks a bunch of new use cases. It's portable across all the data processing engines. It works with event time windowing, um, and it works for present and historical data. So it fits right in with the Beam model. So thank you for listening to this little rundown. Um, I'm Ken at Apache.org. Uh, these slides, if you catch that URL or find them later, uh, they're online. And if you want to dig deeper, there's a design doc. And I wrote sort of a high-level blog post that really walks through this in terms of code. I deliberately avoided code in this talk because it's not fun on a slide and because Java and Python uh, are different. I would need to flip back and forth between those slides, right? Um, and so, yeah, if you do one thing, please go to the Beam website, join the user community. Um, our mailing lists are super supportive and welcoming. Um, uh, the user at beam.apache.org is for the sort of user questions, and if you're curious what's going on in development, that's dev at uh, beam. Um, okay, that's it. Uh, be sure to check out, we've got a birds of a feather session uh, tomorrow. It's on IoT streaming and data flow, and Davor and I will be there talking beam and streaming tomorrow at 5 p.m. Cool. Uh, I think we got plenty of time for questions. Um, how do you manage the size of state without growing monotonously? So the size of your state, uh, like many things in such a generic system, it's going to be up to the user. Like, uh, you can store whatever value you can encode to bytes in state uh, as a user. So. So yeah, I would say it's the user's responsibility. Like we provide, you know, different kinds of state that are sort of efficient for different use cases, but it's not something that we can take care of automatically. Yeah. So is that a lit blocking queue which are basically used you know, behind the scenes um, for the maintaining the state? It looks very similar. Um, well, in fact. What, uh, what Beam provides is really a way for you to describe uh, the computation you're doing, and then um, each Beam runner, right, whether you're running it on Flink or Spark or Google Cloud Dataflow, has its own way of managing the state. So some of them are gonna keep it sort of just on some attached disk that's next to your worker machine. Some of them are gonna have a remote key value store. Um, in batch mode, maybe you only need to store it in memory, things like that. Well, so I guess um, if I, the classic join, stream join algorithms that are sort of not aware of synchronization issues, the um, work with event time windowing is sort of the answer. So if you're doing hourly windows, then you need to buffer um, adequate state just for that hour until sort of the, the system's watermark decides that it actually has all the data for the hour and then we remove the state. So. Synchronization, it doesn't occur explicitly. It just happens because, um, because they all end up in the same window. Does that answer the question a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, actually, I forgot. I should be repeating the question. The question is, if you have two data sources whose times are not synced, um, what do you do about that? Well, one of the things is that Beam's programming model is already assuming both of them are out of order, 
So both of your streams are in some arbitrary order. So sort of the same pieces of the model that are designed so that you get the right answer in that case make it so that it's, it's totally fine if they're not synced up together either. Um, the main thing that will happen is if you have them and there's like a lot of skew between them, so then we have a watermark. Um, I don't know if that's a familiar term or if you saw Davor's talk, but the watermark is for each of these streams, um, the back end maintains an estimate of sort of how complete it is, like what the current time, it, like current time for that stream is. And if one of them is way behind, then when you're doing a join, sort of the combined watermark there is going to be at the slower of the streams. So, so in that sense, if you have, if you're trying to wait until you have all the data for your answer, um, then that's just like actually how long you have to wait to get the data. Uh, but other than that, like that's really the only place where latency is added in terms of getting your output. Um, let's see, address in the back first. Oh, hold on, I actually can't hear you. Yeah. Do what if events uh, like come outside of the window that you're waiting for? And what so happens to those events? Do you kind of archive them? Yeah, um, so the question is what if events come outside of the window that you're waiting for? Um, and the answer is that since event time and processing time are just totally separate things, the event time is just a piece of data, like many windows can be live at the same time. So if a window, if data comes for some window that's not, say, the most recent, it just gets applied to the accumulator for that window and applied to the state for that window. So, um, so that's sort of also inherent in the out of order processing. Um, I don't know of any really explicit comparisons. They have really different, I mean, I would say that structured streaming provides tools with which you could implement a beam runner. Like the beam uh, spark runner has some streaming capabilities. Um, it's not fully complete, but it implements a good amount of the beam model on top of structured streaming. It's a So the question is, uh, when you start emitting updated results, how do you, how do downstream deal with that? Um, and right now the answer <laughs> is uh, very carefully. So <laughs> um, there's two different interesting answers, right? The first thing you need to think about is your sync. Like what are you, what's at the end of your pipeline? Are you writing it um, into like a tabular data store? Are you writing it to files? And that's gonna answer, that's gonna sort of determine which configurations you can use there. Right, so if you're writing to an append only thing, you kind of have to wait till you have the one final answer or you have to write a bunch of diffs and then something like the consumer, somebody doing a query has to uh, account for that in their query. So that's, that's the data sync sort of story is you, I, you just need to know if you, if you have a primary key, maybe you can overwrite the row over and over again or something like that. Um, and then from there, you need to reason about the pipeline yourself actually and set it up that way. So for example, if, if up a, if, Upstream, you're outputting like small incremental summations, then downstream, you need to, um, I guess that one, you can propagate either way, but if you do output whole sums over and over again, and then downstream, just add those together, you'll double count and whatnot. So it's up to the user in that case. Huh. Can you speak a little bit louder? Yeah, so the question is how are failures handled? Um, and so that's up to each engine, um, and it's, it's sort of, it's required that these failures are handled correctly. So the way that they're all gonna do it is you get a bunch of in, incoming elements, um, and you, you need to 
commit the output as well as changes to state for those elements before you acknowledge them. You know, and each, uh, each execution engine actually has like quite different sort of commit protocols as far as that goes. Um, well, you get a lot of portability from it, right? That's, yeah, it is that story. Um, the B model, I think, is, you know, we, we take the good things from the other engines and we try to, like, good, good things back to them. So I think it's a really great programming model to uh, just in terms of usability. Um, and some of these remnants, like, are not exact one-to-one -one correspondences. So... So it is actually, it's, it is a bit different than using them directly. Um, I feel, let's talk offline. You should talk to Davor. He, has, he will have a better answer. Um, but the portability is the story, right? You write in multiple languages. You can mix and match languages. You can run on multiple backends. Um, OK, well, feel free to grab me off the stage anytime. Thanks.